we got to talk about what I think is Jesus' most amazing miracle, which is saying something, because Jesus does a lot of amazing miracles. But this one, I think, is absolutely the most amazing because it was an accident. Like, you didn't even mean to. An accidental miracle. And if you think about that, an accidental miracle has to be the most amazing thing that Jesus ever did, you know, miracle-wise. Because anything that is accidental is always more impressive than something that's on purpose. You may not believe me. This is what I mean. Take a treehouse. So every television show, every movie made between 1950 and oh, about the year 2000 taught me that old-timey children built tree houses. They took tree houses, they put them in the, in the trees, they read comic books, they had candles, they had decoder rings, they had big trunks, you know, with stuff in them. Like, I don't even know what was in the trunk, but there's always a big trunk up there, which was always bizarre, because, like, how did you get the giant trunk up there? Because it's up the tree. Right? They have walkie-talkies in the view before cell phones. Also, like, this is, this is not in any movie or television show after, like, 2005 or so, because, you know, kids stopped going outside. So there's no tree houses. Kids are inside. But regardless, there's always tree houses. But always in these shows or movies or whatever, the kids built the tree houses by themselves, which teaches me. That if I've got like a pile of wood, if I've got, you know, hammer and nails, I've got like an instruction manual from Ikea, something, I can build a tree house in a tree with my buddies, with, with children. So that is one level of impressive, right? But imagine, right? Imagine one day a bunch of kids are out in the woods and they see this pile of wood and they see like hammer and nails stacked up over here. And, like, the kids are play fighting, because this was in the days when kids were allowed to do that, too. And the kids were kind of play fighting, and one of them shoved another kid into the pile of wood. And, like, the kid's like, ow, a splinter right here. And you know, they, they go to get him, and in the process of, you know, everybody wrangling themselves, suddenly a treehouse is, the, is in the tree. Like, they did it by accident. Like, they were just trying to pick the kid up, but they accidentally built a treehouse. Trunk and everything. Imagine if you accidentally, a group of kids, accidentally built a treehouse. That would be so much more impressive than purposely building a treehouse. They'd make one of those videos and put it on Facebook and everything about it. Like, all the, like oh, look how amazing this is. That's what it would be. And that's a stupid illustration. But as I wrote this sermon, I couldn't come up with anything better. I couldn't. Like, I kept thinking, like, what would you accidentally build? And for some reason, old-timey TV shows just kept going to my head. So I leaned into it. They're not all winners, guys. The point is, <laughs> the point is that uh, uh, sometimes things that are accidents are more impressive than things that are on purpose. Um, and so Jesus had this, this, uh, this miracle that was accidental. And it happened like this. One day, Jesus was, was teaching. And he was preaching, and there's this big crowd of people, okay? And he was kind of, there's this a new area to him. There's these people that don't really, you know, he doesn't know these people well at all, and they don't know him well or at all. Um, but he's teaching them, and he's introducing him to his ideas about the kingdom of God for the very first time. And uh, suddenly, the, the sermon is interrupted. Uh, the, the lesson is, is, is interrupted, and, and this guy comes up to Jesus and says, listen, I don't mean to, um, you know, ruin everything, but man, listen, I, my daughter is, is dying and I really need your help. I really need your help to, uh, to heal her, or else she's, she's going to die. And we'll talk about that miracle another week. But that's, that's, that's how the story starts. So Jesus says, okay, well, I need to, I, you know, look, that's more important. This, this girl uh, dying is more important than this sermon. So he says, okay, everybody, hold up. Pause the sermon. We're going to go, uh, I'm going to go deal with this, with this kid. But the thing is, Jesus, like, the sermon was awesome, and the people really liked Jesus, and there's not a lot going on. So the crowd of people decide, we're just going to go with you. Like, we want to see this miracle. If you can perform miracles, if you can bring this girl back from the brink of death, uh, then that's worth seeing. You know, we, yeah, we don't see that kind of stuff very often, so we want to see that. And so the crowd of people went with Jesus and this man to go uh, heal this girl. Well, in that crowd of people was a woman. 
And we don't know that woman's name, but uh, this woman is very distinct in the Bible. You'll never, you'll never forget who this woman is within the pages of the scripture. Because this woman had a, a very unique ailment, a very unique problem that no one else in the Bible has and, and, and really is, is a real issue uh, for who she is uh, culturally and also who she is just as a person. So as you are probably aware, both ladies and gentlemen, that virtually every woman has a period. And virtually every woman has a period that, according to Google, because I don't know, according to Google, lasts between three and eight days. That's what Google told me. What are you laughing at? What? I mean, yeah, okay, I don't want to, I don't want her to do my homework. All right. So. Three to eight days. So that's usually what it is. It's a, like, we'll call it a week or so, right? So you, that, that's, that's the general menstrual cycle of, of a woman. Well, this lady in this crowd, one day, 12 years before meeting Jesus, got her period. And it never went away. Like, it never stopped. And you can imagine, like, after a few days, she's like, okay, well, this should stop soon. And then after, like, two weeks, she's thinking, well, this is unusual. I wish this would stop. And then after a month, now she's probably getting nervous after a month. But then after like three or four months, she probably realizes there's a real problem. But the months actually become years. And for 12 years, her period never stopped. Now, I don't need to explain anything else for anyone who is female <laughs> or who's ever had a, a, a period as to why that's unpleasant. You know, we're not simply talking about, you know, raiding the store shelves for all of the feminine hygiene products. That's not what we're talking about here. We're also talking about pain and discomfort and ah, just a lot of stuff that you know that I don't. So I have been given to, to the understanding, though, that this is a very unpleasant process uh, for a woman. And if you had it for, say, 12 years in a row without relief, what you have is basically 12 years of torture without relief, um, physically speaking. But of course, uh, we're not simply just talking about physical things. Uh, in their culture, we also have uh, to deal with the, the law and religion and societal pressures. And this woman was Jewish. And as an ancient Jewish woman, she was subject to ancient Jewish standards and ancient Jewish practices and ancient Jewish laws. And, you know, I don't, I'm not going to try to explain why. Uh, I don't know that I have an answer as to why. But in ancient Jewish law... Uh, having your period was thought to be an unclean thing. Uh, and not just, you know, physically unclean. I mean, like, spiritually speaking, it was meant to be something that was very, that was unclean. Like, it made you um, an unclean person. It made your house an unclean house. It made the people you encountered with, uh, encountered unclean people. Uh, and so the idea was, and when I say unclean, I don't just mean, you know, I, I mean, like, sinful. I mean, like, you know, spiritually outcast. Like, if you're unclean, if you're spiritually, ceremonially unclean, you can't go to, to the temple or to the synagogue and worship like everybody else. You, you know, you can't, you know, make food and, and, and serve it to people. You can't, you know, uh, the way they understood things was, you know, you could literally touch someone and it made them sinful and, and dirty and unclean. It didn't even just have to be you, though. It could be, you know, you are wearing clothing and the clothing you're wearing, somebody else touches or a chair you sit on. Someone else touches. But all of these things, I mean, it sounds really archaic to us, and well, it is, but that's the way they understood it. And so if you were a woman, uh, that if you, if you were a woman at all and you had your period, you knew for you know, three to eight days, this is how it is uh, all the time. I, you know, I quarantine myself, to use language that we're all very familiar with at the moment. Uh, I quarantine myself away from everyone. I stay away from everyone for, for three to eight days. And when I'm done, I can come back and uh, make myself ceremony and clean again, and everything's fine. But imagine that it never ends. Twelve years, she's unclean. For twelve years, no one can give her a hug. For twelve years, no one can hold her hand. For twelve years, no one can so much as do her laundry and not become tainted themselves. You can understand how this would impact a social relationship. You can understand how this would impact a religious relationship. This would affect everything. And so this woman was in the crowd of Jesus, and for 12 years this had been the case. But it wasn't just a physical thing, and it wasn't just uh, a spiritual thing. It became a financial thing. Turns out, health care is not free. 
and healthcare has never been free. And so this woman uh, was a wealthy woman, had been a wealthy woman, and, and she had spent her entire life saving. She had drained every account she had. She had done everything, paying different doctors, every doctor she could find, every specialist she could find, every holy person she could find, every whatever first century uh, was available to first century Jews, she did. And she made herself complete, homeless and destitute, paying people to try to fix her. And at the end of all of that, all that she ended up with was no money. And so you can imagine the situation this woman's in. Physically, I mean, it is, it is, it is a cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, spiritually speaking, she has nowhere to turn, no one to talk to, uh, nobody, you know, no, no priest or rabbi that would, would ever look at her, no people that would care. And financially now, she's totally broke. There is nowhere for her to go in her culture. And so this homeless woman, probably hanging out with other homeless folks, one day sees this new Jesus guy show up to town, and Jesus is teaching this kingdom of God in which he's saying, blessed are the poor. You know, blessed are, are you know, people who have nothing. And he says, I am like a doctor here for sick people. And Jesus says all the things that he says. And then he gets interrupted by a guy who comes along and says, hey, I need a healing. And the woman, at that point, her ears perk up. Again, she doesn't know Jesus. She has no idea what Jesus can or can't do. But somebody just came and asked Jesus for a healing. And well, she's a person who needs a healing. I mean, she sure is. <laughs> so she thought, well, I've tried everything else. Might as well give this a shot. And she kind of pushes through the crowd, which is ironic because she's making everybody unclean the whole time. They don't even know. They have no idea, though. They don't care. I mean, they would care if they knew, but, like, it's, you can't care about something you don't know, which just shows the ridiculousness of the whole thing. Anyway, so pushing through. And uh, she tries to reach out to Jesus, but she can't quite get there. And so all she can really get is, like, a grab, like, she can grab his, you know, his clothes, the end of his, you know, the end of his robe she was able to get. And she thought, man, if, if I could just touch the guy, like maybe that'll work. I have no, no evidence that it would, but I got nothing to lose. And it's then that Jesus performed an accidental miracle. Jesus did not mean to heal this woman. In no way did he heal her, did he mean to at all. And yet, he did. And this, this is amazing. I, like guys, this is one of my favorite miracles because it is so poetic. This is a woman whose clothing could make other people sinful somehow in, in their, in their you know, theology, in the way that they thought about things. You know, if you touch her clothes, you become unclean, right? And so she touches Jesus' clothes, not even Jesus, just Jesus' clothes, and she becomes now clean and healed. And she touches Jesus' robe, and she stops bleeding. Listen, I, I don't know what that's like. That has got to be the greatest moment <laughs> that any person can ever have. So, this is what happened, though. This is what we read in the Gospel according to Mark happened next. It's important that we read this. So Jesus performs the accidental miracle, and then we read this. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? A couple of verses later, after talking about who touched him, a couple of verses later, it says, the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Now, look, I've never had a 12-year-long affliction of any kind, much less a 12-year-long menstrual cycle. I've, ne I've never been healed miraculously of, of anything like that. I've never been sick, really, of anything that goes on more than a few days. I don't know exactly how I would react to being healed of something that has afflicted me for 12 years. 
but I'm going to guess it's not going to be that. I mean, Mark says that the woman was frightened. She was frightened. That she was trembling. Like, so scared. Like, I, I don't think I've ever been so scared I've trembled either. Like, I, I, I don't think I've ever in my life been so terrified of something that I have a physical response to it. That make like, you know, I'm shaking, I'm so scared. I mean, you see them like, cartoons and stuff. But this woman, was, was, she was shaking, she was trembling. She was so frightened. And that makes me wonder, why? Accidental miracle, super cool. Great, I love it, it's awesome. But why is this woman responding this way? And it's interesting because there is a standard answer. Like, there's an answer that, that we always give for this. And, and I think it's, you know, maybe it's an okay answer. Like, maybe, maybe. You know, the answer is, oh, well, you know, she's scared because she was unclean and now she's touched Jesus. And she's, you know, she's scared that Jesus would respond, you know, to her angrily because she had now made him unclean. And I don't, I don't know if that actually works. Because why would she think Jesus would do that? Like, what in her head would make her think Jesus is going to respond angrily? You know, enough, angry enough. I mean, if you're, if you're shaking you're, you're with, with fear, you're, so, you're shaking so much, you're almost anticipating, like, violence or something, right? Like, and you're, you're, you know, he's going to hit you or, you know, humiliate you in some way. Or, or what, like, why would she think he'd do that? And, and I actually, I like the idea, too. We're talking about healthcare not being free. Uh, she had just stolen from Jesus, if you think about it. She'd paid all these other people. <laughs> nothing would work. Uh, she didn't pay Jesus nothing. Maybe she's scared of that. <laughs> I don't know. But the, I mean, it just you know just say, it brings up the same questions. Why? You know why? By the way, as an aside, you ever read about Jesus taking money for healing people? We know in this world that people are paid for that. And Jesus didn't. That's probably a sermon for another day. But it's right there in the, in the text. The question, though, is why? Like, why would she be so afraid of Jesus? I think the important, the real important thing as we look at this is to understand, um, the really important thing to understand, though, is she doesn't know Jesus. She has absolutely no reason to think he would do this based on Jesus, because she doesn't know Jesus, which means her fear is not based on what she knows of Jesus, but it's what she knows about Jesus. And all this woman knows about Jesus, all she knows, is that he's a rabbi. That's all she knows. All she knows is he's a religious teacher. And so it stands to reason that her fear is coming not from what she knows of Jesus, but what she knows of religious teachers. Something about religious teachers has made her think, I should be afraid for what I have done. And that makes me ask, well, what does she know that we don't? And the answer is nothing. We just need to read our Bibles. <laughs> we know exactly why she's afraid once we frame it like that. Here's another miracle. One day Jesus is, goes to the temple. Not the temple. I don't think it's the temple. I think it's a synagogue. Yeah, it's a synagogue. He goes to the synagogue. I get those words confused. It doesn't matter. He goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, on a Saturday, the day of rest. And Jesus goes, and he's far enough into his ministry so far that the other religious leaders, they already hate him. They already are against him. They're already fighting with him. They're already opposing him at every turn. And so Jesus, if you can imagine, it goes into this room. He goes, he goes to church, and he goes into the church, and all these religious leaders all turn and look at him. And just, you know, they just stare, you know, flaming arrows into his soul. Like, just the kind of just anger is, they, like, you don't have to say, we hate you or we're threatening you. They're just staring at him. And, and, and Jesus just knows, I mean, these people, these guys hate me, but he's not here for them. He's here for uh, worship. He's here for the, the church service, as, uh, such as it was. And so it's on this Sabbath that, that he's there, and the Pharisees hate him. And uh, that's when he sees a man with a withered hand. A man with a withered hand. A, a guy who can't do anything with it. And in 2020, a man with a withered hand, like, that's barely even a disability. <laughs> like, I mean, so much of what we do is not, like, physical labor. Like, you know, if somebody has a withered hand, you just teach them how to, like, you know, do computers with one hand, and they're going to be smarter than us anyway. But back then, in a world without computers, in a world without that kind of labor, 
you got to work with your hands. If you're a man, you work with your hands. Having a withered hand, having a hand that doesn't work, man, that, it's almost a death sentence. It's definitely a sentence of, you know, needing to beg. It's definitely a sentence of, you know, you can't provide for a family, which means you're not allowed to have a family. You know, nobody's going to marry you, uh, you know, because you can't provide for them, which means now you don't have a family, you don't have a wife, you don't have kids, and, and, and you know, you don't have a job, and so that means you don't have a home, and that means, you know, it's a terrible existence for them. And guys, I know that we're not always the coolest about disabilities in our world, but we have improved greatly since the first century when it comes to treating people with disabilities well. This man's life was miserable. And so Jesus sees this guy with the, the withered hand, and he sees the Pharisees, and he realizes. Like something just hits him. He, he just realizes, these guys are focused on me. These guys hate me <laughs> for what I stand for. And yet here's a guy in their midst that needs compassion and care and love, and they don't even, they don't even see that he's there. They're looking past that guy to you know, yell at me with their eyes. And so Jesus uh, decides to do something. He, does, he says one of the most interesting things. It's a sermon for another day. But you know, at, a, at a point in the service when he would be able to, uh, without interrupting, he brings the guy kind of in front of everyone, but you know, the Pharisees, but everybody else. And, and knowing what they believe about the, the Sabbath, by the way, that you're not supposed to like, you know, do, you're not supposed to do work, you're not supposed to do anything on that day, it's a great sin. Um, he brings the guy in front of him and, and, and he words it really, really interesting. He said, is the Sabbath a day to do good things? It's not behind me yet. Don't jump in. I looked down because I forgot the exact wording. That's what she's at. He says, is the Sabbath a day to do good things or is the Sabbath a day to do evil? That's an extremely interesting phrasing, and it's even more interesting when he says, is it okay today if I save a life, meaning this guy, or if I destroy it? It's interesting. Again, a sermon for another day, but Jesus understood that this man is somebody he could help. And if he did not help this man, he took responsibility for destroying the man's life. To not help him was to be responsible for the man's destruction. Man, is that something that hits us right between the eyes. To not do something you can do is it to do it evil. Man, that makes you think. And I think some people were thinking about it. But then this happened. Now it's going to be behind me. <laughs> he interrupts their thoughts of that craziness, and it says Jesus looked around at them angrily. He was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and he was restored. At once the Pharisees went away to meet with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. So just so we're aware, just so we're just real clear about this. We need to be real blunt. Here's a guy whose life was destroyed, whose life was nothing, who had nothing at all, had no you know, family, home, job, had no prospects for family, home, job. Jesus fixes all of that, heals the man, and in response, the religious leaders of the day said, we got to get together with the government and kill him. You'll also notice that's Mark chapter 3. It's so early. That's like their only move. It's so early in Jesus' ministry for them. Uh, you know, 16 chapters in Mark. This is the beginning of the story still. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and they're already trying to figure out how do we get together with the government to kill him. It's amazing how quickly Jesus, you know, disenfranchised these people by doing basic nice things. But you know, it's interesting because they did this because they read the Bible the way they read the Bible. They read the Bible and interpreted the Bible and said, oh, well, okay, well, you can't do anything on the Sabbath, so, well, that's it. I mean, like, they felt like they had the moral high ground. Jesus was the bad guy because he's the one breaking the rules. Jesus is the bad guy. Well, doesn't, Jesus doesn't understand the Bible. We understand the Bible. And so they felt good about it. And by the way, that's not the only time that happens. There's actually even, if, if you believe it, a more revealing moment in the life of the Pharisees revolving around the Sabbath. So another Sabbath, fast forward. Another Sabbath, Jesus finds another guy who needs healing. This guy, the guy's blind. This time, the guy's blind. So Jesus heals the blind guy. And this time, Jesus, I mean, I think probably he's just so tired of talking to these people. 
You know, he's just, I'm just out. Like, I healed you. Have a good day. I'm getting ice cream. And that's just what Jesus does. And so, um, but the Pharisees, you, they see this guy because, as you might imagine, this guy he'd never seen before. He was blind from birth. It was a really happy day for him now that he can see. And he kind of made, a, a, you know, a stir. He kind of made a, um, a spectacle as he was celebrating. And so they, they came and they got the guy and they recognized him because, you know, he was the guy that they'd seen that was always blind. And they kind of start grilling him. And they, they grill him about what happened and they very quickly realize this must have been Jesus because no one else, uh, no one else would possibly dare to do something like this on the Sabbath. Nobody would possibly dare go against us like this. Um, so they knew it had to be Jesus. And so they tried to get the guy. They thought, okay, well, here's our chance. If we can get this guy to denounce Jesus, to say that Jesus is this bad guy, this sinner, this horrible person, then if even the people he heals uh, don't like him, well, that's a big, that's a big feather in our cap. And, and so they try to get him to say it. The guy won't say it. They go so far as to go get the guy's parents and try to, like, turn the parents against him and, and threaten to, like, kick him out of the synagogue forever, which is a big deal. If you can't go to the synagogue, you're, you know, disconnected from, from God in their um, theological framework. And so basically cut them off from God and the community. And they make all these threats, and, and all this stuff happens. And in the end, the blind guy becomes a guy I absolutely love in the scriptures because he just, it's just, he just doesn't care what the Pharisees have to say anymore. He just decides, I'm done. And he gets real sarcastic and real lippy and starts making fun of the Pharisees uh, to their faces. And that does not go well for him. And at the end, he just says, well, it's weird. You guys are speaking for God here. And uh, yet that guy healed me, so he must be from God, but you disagree. So what does that say about you guys? And that's when the Pharisees tell this guy this. And this is so big for us to see. In John chapter 9, we read this. They tell the man who had just been healed, they tell him this. The Pharisees say, you were born a total sinner, they answer. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. Three things we learn about the Pharisees there. The first thing is we learn how the Pharisees felt about the people they serve. The Pharisees are religious leaders. They're basically pastors. And here's how they felt about basically their parishioners. They say, you were born evil. You're a total sinner. I mean, what does that say about how you feel about someone? Not just that you think they're sinful and evil and bad, but no, 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 no. You were born that way. There's something broken in who you are. I cannot imagine what would possess a religious teacher to say that to anyone. And yet the Pharisees say it to this guy. You're born evil. That's how they felt about people. <laughs> if you don't like what they have to say, you're born evil. The second thing we learn how they feel about themselves is this, who are you to teach us? They felt that they were above the guy. They were elevated above this guy. They didn't want to listen to anyone. They didn't want to learn from anyone. They were better than the people that they served. They were better than the people that uh, they were here to help. They were better than them. They were above them. That's how they felt about themselves. I cannot imagine what would possess a religious leader from believing they were above other people. And yet that is what their arrogance had taught them to do. And finally, we learn what they think about religion. <laughs> they kicked him out of the synagogue, which is to say they believed they were allowed to kick someone away out of the synagogue, which is to say they thought they were allowed to cut someone else out of the presence of God. They thought that they had the right and the responsibility to stop people from coming to God if they were the wrong kind of people. Man, I can't understand what would possess anybody to do that. But they thought this was their house. This is who they were. And, and you know, when we understand that about the Pharisees, when we understand that like they respond to a healing with, you know, going to the government to, to plot 
somebody's murder, when we understand that they you know, respond to another one uh, by, by showing all their cards and showing that they really they think nothing good about the people they serve, they think everything good about themselves, they believe that they are the ones that speak for God, man, of course the woman would be afraid. Jesus, she thinks, is just one of those guys. He's just another religious teacher. And you know the worst thing? We brought this up before. It needs to be brought up all the time. These people couldn't read. This woman can't read. You can put a, the Bible in her hand, and she has no idea what to do with it. It's estimated that we, that we have a 90% illiter illiteracy rate back then, which means not only, can they, not only are they stuck with these religious leaders, but these religious leaders communicate to them who God is in an inarguable way. Who could argue? Nobody can read. Nobody can look at the scriptures and say, well, that's not who you're supposed to be. It's no wonder that the woman was afraid. And it's no wonder then that Jesus just changes everything. He looked at the woman and he said, your faith has made you well. I, mean, I get the impression, he's like, that was amazing. I didn't, didn't know I could do that. Had no, had no idea that was going to happen today. Good job, you. <laughs> he offers her peace. He offers an end to her suffering. She was afraid, but with Jesus, she didn't have to be. And I know it's a really obvious thing. It's a really obvious statement, but if we can compare the religious leaders and their attitude to, the, to Jesus and his, I mean, the religious leaders, they, they, they look down on everyone who's around them. They look at themselves as if they're amazing. They believe that they own everything. They're the arbiters of God. And now you look at Jesus. Jesus is not afraid that this woman who was unclean touched him. Jesus is not afraid to go into a temple and heal a guy knowing everybody hates him. Jesus is not afraid or ashamed to go to a blind man who's been, born, who's been that way since you know, his whole life, since before he was born. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, you were born evil. Jesus just says, here, let me help you. And I think part of it is because Jesus didn't think that God belonged to him. Because at the end of the day, Jesus accidentally healed this woman. He didn't even mean to. It wasn't his choice to heal this woman. It just happened. And that tells us very much about the way that Jesus understands God. God is not for the few. But God is for everyone. God does not belong to anyone. Because we all belong to God. Jesus' miracles tell a distinctly different story about us, about God, about the world, than the religious leaders. And quite frankly, this woman should have been afraid. But with Jesus, she never had to be again. And that's the truth for us as well. Our third lesson from the stories that miracles tell, as we think about this woman and her fear, is this. God in his love and kindness is far greater than the people who have taught us to be afraid. God in his love and kindness is far greater than the people who have taught us to be afraid. One thing, it's going to be, it's not a, a, it's an unpleasant thing, we have to say it. It's the reason so much religion is built on fear. There's a reason. It's easy easiest way to manipulate people is just to make them afraid of everything and say, well, I've got the answer. It's so easy. The Pharisees had followed the path of least resistance here. And quite frankly, the attitude of the Pharisees is the easiest attitude for any of us to have. In fact, I dare say every good person on planet Earth has to fight the urge to not be like the Pharisees. We've got to fight to not look down at other people and say, well, at least I'm better than them. We have to fight that urge to not look at people who are different than us or think different or believe different or look different or whatever, love different. Uh, we, we, it's so hard for us to not look at them and say, well, yeah, they're terrible people. 
And then it's also, it's just as hard, maybe harder for us to not look in the mirror and say, man, you're pretty slow. It's so hard for us to not fall in love with ourselves and say, I mean, even people with like terrible self-esteem, uh, those people are, are obsessing on themselves all the time. It's so easy to obsess about who we are constantly and put ourselves on a pedestal. And man, if you're a religious person, if you believe in God, the easiest thing in the world is for you to believe that God belongs to you. That church belongs to you. That, that, that faith is, is the category of, of your beliefs and your ideas and your understanding and your enlightened positions. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to me, because that's me. Everything I just said, including that self-esteem thing. Man, it's so easy to be a Pharisee. It's so easy. It's so much harder to be loving and kind and, and generous. It's so much harder to drive out fear with love and say, I'm not going to be afraid of other people. I'm not going to be afraid of God. I'm not going to be afraid of life. I'm not going to be afraid of myself. That's hard. I get it. Like, I, I get why the Pharisees existed. I get why the Pharisees have existed for the last 2,000 years. I get why, uh, I don't even want to get, guess how, what percentage of churches are led by Pharisees. I mean, they call them something else. Reverend, pastor, father. This is Pharisee. I don't want to guess how often I'm a Pharisee. Because it's so easy. And this, these miracles teach us that God is better than that. God is better than what's easy. God is better than people who teach fear, people who believe fear. You just don't have to anymore. We're like that woman, and she's terrified. And she thinks she's falling on her knees in front of someone that she should be afraid of, but instead it's Jesus saying, well, that was neat. <laughs> Your faith made you well. Look at that. Your faith did that. Peace. You have peace. Your suffering is over. That's the love of God that we have. That's who we can live for, and that's who we can be. When your musicians are going to forward, they're going to sing a song. I say they, but I also mean me. We're going to sing a song. We offer an invitation each and every week. If, you are, if you've never understood and accepted this idea, this understanding, uh, the Bible teaches that, that we're to repent and be baptized. We're to, to say, I want things God's way. I want to see that God is only ever good. I want to see that God is no one to be afraid of, and, and I want to embrace his love. The Bible teaches that when we do that, that in baptism, uh, it's a picture of that. We go down in the water. It's like our old selves being put to death. Uh, we get out of the water, so our new selves being born again, and, and we're whole, and we're new, and we're forgiven, and God's with us. If you're new to make the decision, we've got a nice warm baptistry. All sorts of people can do it. We can do it anytime. Let's talk at any time. If you're an immersed believer in Christ, looking for a perfect church, church home, this place is not it. That, that, that treehouse thing was terrible. I didn't, I didn't like that at all. Uh, so we're not perfect, but we do serve a perfect God. We want to connect. We want to cultivate. Call, we want to connect. We want to call. We want to cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. We want to grow up while we do it. We want to understand that God is greater than those who have taught us to fear. As we stand.